we are so honored to have with us someone you all know extremely well. Everyone knows David Rubenstein with his latest magnum opus. David is a great public thinker, as you know, great philanthropist, great leader in all sorts of areas of American life. And full disclosure, has been my close friend for, what, 30 years? Right. So if, if I'm particularly polite, it will not be for that reason. Okay. Uh, but the book is an absolutely wonderful book. You know, one, of, one of the miraculous things that I, I've seen in recent years is, you know, David has always been this, this dignified figure in finance, you know, world statesman and all this, philanthropist. And, you know, the rest of us, these hack authors who, you know, have to go to bookstores and elbow our way onto TV programs to sell our books and so on. And I remember saying to my wife, Afsane, who's one of your members, who's here with you, uh, us today, you know, David, I know that he can write the books, but I'm not sure that, you know, David is going to be very good in that world of, you know, buy my book and, uh, you know, here's the price and, you know, buy 10 for Christmas and read it 10 times, this kind of thing. Uh, but he does this just as superbly and gracefully and effectively as anyone who's been doing well, this for 40 years. I, I give the books away mostly, so, I, uh, <laughs> I, I, so, I, so nobody so has to buy it. the books. Okay, so that's what I'll start doing. Uh, it's taken me a while, but now David has told me the secret, and I, I'll emulate him henceforth. So instead of the bestseller list, best giveaway list. Right, I well. I just have that. It, it works for David, so I'll, I'll see what I can do. In any case, thank you all for sponsoring this. I thought I'd begin not so much on the book, uh, but one of the things that's wonderful about this book is that David talks about what it really means to be an American. A big part of that is immigration and the people who come here. And do you mind talking a little bit about how your family came here? Yeah, sure. Um my family uh, escaped from Ukraine, the, my, on my father's side. Um, the Ukraine had a um, uh, pogrom against Jews in the early part of the 20th century, so a lot of Jews more, left. More, more than one, I think. Right, right. Uh, they have many. So uh, Ukraine was a gigant, gigantic uh, Jewish population, and then there was some anti-Semitism. So uh, my ancestors were not the smartest, I would say, and so they bought a ticket to the United States, they thought, with other Jewish uh, people from uh, Ukraine, and they wound up in Leeds, England, because they, it was a scam, and the scam basically took them only to Leeds, England. So they and about, I don't know, 20 or 30,000 Jews from Ukraine lived in Leeds, England for a long time because they could figure out how to get enough money to get to the United States. But my grandfather came over um, in, uh, when he was like 10 years old, and when I did something at the National Archives, they gave me the manifest it showed, um, he was on a boat that landed in Philadelphia, and it says in there, you know, 10 years old and has your religion, Hebrew, which I guess was important for everybody to know. Uh, but um, I, uh, I would say on immigration, generally, it is amazing how many immigrants we have in this country. We have 46 million immigrants. In no other country in the world is there anything close to that. And people come here because of the beliefs that we have uh, about our, what our country can do for people. And it is amazing to me that, um, we are seen as a country of immigrants, but for so long we were not a country of immigrants. For so long, we actually didn't really encourage people to come. When the country first started, anybody could show up. There were no passports, no visas. You just show up. And then for the first you know, uh, several decades, people showed up. They're mostly from Western Europe. But then in the 1800s, people started showing up from Eastern Europe, people who were Jewish, people who were Greek, people who were Italian. And then Asians showed up. And then people from Latin America showed up. And all of a sudden, people in Congress said, wait a second, the homogenous population we have, it's being destroyed. So after several decades of debate, Congress finally, in 1925, passed legislation that said, no more of this. We're going to have quotas. And we want more or less Western Europeans come in. And that made it very difficult for people to come in until the law was changed in 1965. Now we more or less have that law which means that you don't have to be from a certain area. You don't have these rigid quotas. The quotas were so rigid that some of you may remember the SS uh, um, uh, St. Louis, which was a boat filled of uh, people who were trying to escape uh, Nazi Germany. It came within a mile of Miami and was turned away by our State Department because we didn't have enough 
quotas to let Jewish people in. So it was returned to Europe, and about a third of the people went back into a, holo went into a holo uh, concentration camp and were killed. So the, 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 the immigration that we have in this country has ups and downs. We've welcomed immigrants. We now are a country that legally, we, uh, we have about 800,000 people coming in e legally every year who become citizens. And uh, well, obviously many more come in uh, legally but not uh, become citizens. But it's a country where we have more immigration than any other country in the world by far. Nobody's even close. Reminds me a little bit of the woman who came from an apocryphal story, but uh, one of these stories that historians say, too good to check. Right. So uh, at least as the story goes, uh, the woman came and she was trying to get her citizenship and she was asked by the authorities. She came from this violent country in Europe and she was asked, do you support the overthrow of the United States government by force or violence? She was quiet for a moment and she said, I think violence. <laughs> uh, in any case, uh, one of the things that runs throughout David's books and his life is his reverence for history and his feeling that knowing history and being taught history is a crucial part of being an American. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, the theory of history is that if you know the past, you are unlikely to make as many mistakes in repeating the past. The famous George, uh, Harvard historian George Santayana said, those people that don't remember the past are condemned to relive it. So that's the whole theory of history as it's been studied from the times of Thucydides on. You should learn the past, figure out what the mistakes were, and improve. All of civilization and all of life is about improving. Evolution is about improving, and, and life is about improving and making um, improvements, in part by making sure you don't make the mistakes of the past if you can avoid it. So sadly, we, we really haven't taught history as well as I think we should. And as some of you have heard me say before, uh, right now, the best evidence of that is that when you give tests to history or civics to people in this country, they don't do that well. The, the most uh, glaring example is, um, is this. Right now, if you're, are there any uh, people in this, country, in this audience now who are uh, naturalized Americans? Anybody here are naturalized? Okay, there's a naturalized American. Anybody else? Okay. So if you're a naturalized American, you have to take a citizenship test uh, in the, under current laws. And more or less, five years of residency, um, good moral character, presumably, and then you take a test. The test is administered by an administrator, used to be a judge, and you're asked 10 of a potential 100 questions. Of the 100 questions, you're given those questions in advance. And the questions are things like, how many branches are in the federal government, who is the first president of the United States, so forth. Um, 81, 91% of the people who take that test as prospective citizens pass, 91% pass that test, which is pretty good. Um, and actually, uh, the test is, um, is one that I wouldn't say is the hardest test in the world, but 91% uh, pass, which means that people study it and they know a little about history when they become a, a citizen. The same test was more or less given by a foundation to a, a several million Americans a few years ago. And in 49 out of 50 states, a majority of citizens failed the basic test. So only one state, Vermont, did a bare majority, 53%, pass this basic test. So in my book, I've tried to put in what the basic citizenship test is in the back of the book. It, these are the questions you have to take if you pass if you were a, a prospective citizen. And some of you might take a look at it and see whether you could pass. Hopefully, everybody, of course, in this audience would pass 100%. But um, it is amazing how little we really teach uh, kids right now and, and how little um, you know, people know about our history. And it's really sad. In fact, I, sometimes I've been in China and other countries, and I've asked American history questions to, to students, and they know the answers. I think that people in, in Chinese schools may know more about American history than sometimes kids in American history, uh, schools know for a lot of reasons. Do you think there's any cause and effect here that you know, we're in a time where we keep hearing and reading about groups in this country who do not particularly respect democracy or who are indifferent to it? Is part of that lack of education about our history and about what democracy is? The theory of, an, of our representative democracy, and basically what I'm talking about in the American experiment, is that it was an experiment in, a, in democracy. There had never been a case before in, in civilization where people came together and said, guess what, we're going to create a, dem a, a democracy. We're not going to have an autocrat, we're not going to have a king, we're going to have a democracy, and uh, we're going to let people vote. 
Now, obviously, it wasn't perfect. We didn't let the, get the people vote for president. We have the Electoral College. They couldn't vote for the Senate initially. The legislatures did that. But they, and, and not everybody could vote. But people who could vote were generally white property men. Um, when we, the country was set up, blacks could not vote. Um, women could not vote. Uh, people didn't have property, largely couldn't vote. So it was restricted, but it was an unusual kind of representative democracy that came together. And the theory of it was that uh, people should be allowed to vote if they're informed and they know what they're doing, and they have some intelligence about what the government's all about. If you don't know what is going on in the government, then maybe you're not going to have a very good uh, uh, government, because the theory was always informed citizenry would be make a better government. And sometimes we have you know, un uninformed people who don't know anything about what's going on in the country, and while they should be allowed to vote, it'd be better if they were more informed about what's going on in the country. That's my theory, at least. Uh, David, among the other 90 things he does perfectly in all sorts of different spheres, is a University of Chicago trained lawyer uh, and practiced for years and still practices in, in various ways, although maybe not in the orthodox way. Uh, my question would be, just looking at the Constitution as a legal document, is that protecting us as well in 2021 as it did in 1789? Well, we, the, question, the question is protecting, protecting democracy us. as well. Yeah, we're protecting yeah. democracy. Yeah. Um, I'd say when the country was first set up, um, the legislative branch was designed to be the most important branch, honestly. It, it was Article I. The presidency was thought to be important, but not quite as important as it later became. And the judiciary was not an afterthought, but they clearly did not expect at the time that the judiciary would rule certain laws unconstitutional. That was relatively novel. Today, I think the, the Supreme Court has been more or less over the last you know, 40, 50 years or so, the entity that's been willing to make the tough political decisions, rightly or wrongly, because Congress is unable to act for all the reasons we know on tough decisions. So the law of the land, whether you agree with it or not, on abortion has basically been made by Congress, I mean by, by the court. Congress has really absented itself uh, on voting rights, what it, whatever you might think about uh, what is appropriate to do, more or less the Supreme Court has ruled certain things uh, are appropriate or not appropriate. More or less we've kicked the main issues that we can't resolve in Congress to the, to the courts. So I think that's actually a pretty good uh, thing in some respects because it at least gets some resolution. And in fact, I dedicate the book to public servants who protected our democracy. And obviously there were many of them uh, in the events of post uh, the most recent election, I think, who stood up and protected our democracy. But I, I would say that the Constitution is imperfect for sure. It had a birth defect of slavery. It still has many challenges. The ERA is still not part of the Constitution. On the other hand, there's no document that's lasted as long as a, a, as a document governing a country as this one has, has lasted. And interestingly, uh, when you go into the military or you go into the federal government, you take an oath of allegiance to a document, not to a person which is unique, it's nowhere, another place in the world do you take an oath of allegiance to a document that was written 250 years ago or so. When you think about it, that the idea that we've only had 27 amendments and 10 of them were the original Bill of Rights, relatively modestly amended compared to so many other constitutions which are um, amended all the time or, or basically changed all the time. So it's a pretty impressive document. I don't think any of the people who drafted it thought it would last this long. Thomas Jefferson, who was not part of the Constitutional Convention, thought maybe it should last 20 years, and every 20 years we should change the way the government is working. But it's obviously worked reasonably well. But when you think back on it, it is amazing how we, we've lived through an era when, where um, people didn't have basic rights. Um, in the book, I point out, for example, that people who, had, who were um, gay were often, in the 1950s and 40s, they were arrested for being gay taken out of their offices and arrested and put in jail for being gay. No, no gay act was committed, but they were just, they were said to be gay. And, and, and this was considered okay in those days. It's amazing that um, many people who were leaders in our country um, in, in many areas, Eleanor Roosevelt, were against having the right for women to vote. We didn't get the right for women to vote until 1920, more or less. It was, we barely got it. One, one state made it possible at the end. Uh, Jim Free's state, Tennessee, uh, made it possible for, for that to happen. Um, but many le leading women thought this was a bad thing. It would ruin uh, you know, families and so forth. So it's, the Constitution has had its ups and downs, but on the whole, I wouldn't trade it for any other uh, governing document that, that governs any other country. 
Sure, and that's one of the things that we learned from history, I think, uh, right. if you study it carefully. One of the great things about this book, there are many virtues, and one of them is that David has had conversations with all sorts of thinkers about some of these issues, but one of them is what David calls uh, America's 13 key genes. Uh, it won't surprise you to know that one of them, actually the first he mentions is democracy. Uh, number two is voting. Right. You know, we keep on hearing now that uh, the sanctity of the vote in the United States is in jeopardy today. Does that sound right to you? It's an interesting phenomenon that we have, um, we have men and women have died overseas in military combat to protect our right to vote, yet we have a relatively small percentage of people voting. In the last presidential election, I believe we had 62% of the eligible voters vote, 62%. In some countries, Australia and other places, you have close to 90% of eligible people voting. So we have fought very hard to preserve the right to vote, but sometimes we don't really exercise it that much. Uh, still, I think the right to vote is one of the most important things that we have in our Constitution and the way our government works. It's, I, I suspect the reason that people ha don't vote is either they, they are satisfied that the outcome will probably be the way they want it to be anyway, uh, I guess. I don't know why people don't vote when they, when they are eligible to vote and, 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 and can vote. But, Right now, obviously, voting rights are under uh, attack, and it's clear that people are, are not happy in some parts of the country with the way some of the elections have, have changed and, and are likely to change. When John Kennedy was elected president, some of you may be as old as me uh, or remember John Kennedy, um, when he was elected president of the United States in 1960, 90% of the population in this country was white. Not the voting base, 90% of the population was white, 10% was non-white, and mostly that was African American. Today, it's 60% white and 40% non-white, and it's obviously going to be a majority non-white uh, uh, majority non-white country in the not too distant future. And that has meant that some people are white or not happy with the way things are likely to go in their view, and therefore, they, in my view, try to restrict the, the way people are, are, are able to vote. It's not that easy to vote in some places now. For example, if you want to vote absentee in Houston, Harris County, um, it's a big area, I think the third or fourth biggest city in the United States. There's only one place where you'll be able to drop off your absentee ballot in all of Harris County. Obviously not designed to encourage people to drop off their absentee ballots. So I, I, what I was talking about in the genes is really this. Um, all of us have genes. Uh, we have them from our parents and they got them from their parents and so forth. And we have you know, millions of genes in our body, but uh, there's some that are more important than others perhaps. And I've said in our country, Every country has genes. If you are from Mongolia or Germany or South Afri Africa, you have certain genes that are embedded into your, your system and you bl have beliefs, which are really the genes I'm talking about. And in our country, I, I said that we have lots of genes each of you possess, but there are 13 that I emphasize that are really part of our, our, our nature, our DNA. For example, the belief in the right to vote, the belief in in equality, the belief in now diversity, the belief in the immigration, the belief in the American dream. Uh, these are things that are part of our culture and they are just endemic to what, who we are because we're Americans. And so I tried to describe in the book how these genes evolved and, and how we still struggle with some of them. The right to vote is a good example. Not everybody wants everybody to have the same right to vote. But we generally believe that the right to vote is important because generally we believe if you vote, you can probably change the outcome uh, 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 the way the government's going. And so that's why we value the vote so, so importantly, because we know you can actually change things. In Russia, for example, it's unlikely that, while 99% of the people vote, um, very few people think you're gonna change the outcome. Here we do actually think we can change the outcome by voting. Sure. Uh, changing gears a little bit. You got a favorite president? Well, um, I'd say if you take a look at the presidents that we've had in our country, uh, and, and there's no doubt in my mind that the leading, the most important president was Abraham Lincoln. He held the country together in ways that many people didn't think was necessary. At the time that he was elected, although he actually said at the time, this is something that people have gotten lost in history, at the time, uh, the, his predecessor was James Buchanan. And James Buchanan was trying to get past the 13th Amendment. Then the current 13th Amendment basically eliminates slavery. But a new 13th Amendment, before the one we now have, was being proposed by James Buchanan. And that 13th Amendment said, slavery is the law of the land. And it wasn't clear, if it wasn't clear in the Constitution before, I'm gonna make it clear, we're gonna have slavery. That was the, gonna be the proposed 13th Amendment. And many states ratified it. 
when he was sworn in as President of the United States in his inaugural address, Abraham Lincoln said he supported that. And despite that fact, many people in the South had believed that he was going to eliminate slavery. Um, his view was that slavery in the newer states shouldn't be uh, sanctified, but in the existing states he thought it was part of the Constitution, he didn't want to change it. But nonetheless, states seceded, and many people thought at the time, if the southern states seceded, let them go. Uh, Lincoln didn't have that view, and so he fought very hard, and, and we had went through the Civil War to preserve the Union. Had he not done that, I suspect we'd have two different countries now, and I think it was better off to have gone through the Civil War and, and won it the way we did. But to me, he held the country together. He also exhibited an enormous amount of humility, enormous amount of grace and charm and other kinds of things that uh, we could use more of today, let's say. So I would say uh, uh, he was, the, in my view, the, the, the greatest president by, by far. Yeah, I certainly would not I assume as somebody from Illinois, you agree. I was going to say, I was looking at Sharon Rockefeller, who was nodding, and Tony Bush, who was nodding, and I'm sure there are others from Illinois here, and maybe a few Lincoln people who were not from Illinois. Uh, what would you say that John Kennedy brought to the country? You're the head of the Kennedy Center, right. and you've spent a lot of time thinking about him and his legacy. Well, John Kennedy, uh, when you think back on it, he was so young. He was 43 years old. Uh, now, um, you know, I'm 72 years old. I'm too young to be president myself. It's, I mean, too, it's just too young. Um, you need to be, you know, close to 80 to be president of the United States now. But only 43 years old. And, uh, you know, it's just amazing. And it's also amazing when you think about it, his wife was 31 years old. And when he was assassinated, she was 34 years old. Hard to believe how young they were. Um, John Kennedy clearly uh, got off on a good footing with his inaugural address. Some of you may remember it quite well. Um, it just inspired people to want to participate in government and gave people an uplifting uh, sense of, uh, of be being an American. And, and interestingly, if you want to look at the key to that, that speech, among other things, it, it really doesn't promise anything. The speech was a brilliant speech um, delivered in about uh, geez, I, that's under 20 minutes or so. Mm, um, it was. But it, it was a speech where he doesn't promise to do anything. He barely uses the word I in it. And he basically has uplifting language, doesn't promise legislative action, doesn't promise a bill or anything like that. It's a really a call to arms and somewhat a Cold War speech. But it was a speech that, that even um, his opponents, Richard Nixon, Dwight Eisenhower said it was an incredible speech. And it's still remembered as, I think, one of the two or three best inaugural addresses ever. And he got off on a good footing, except that when the Bay of Pigs happened, he made a mistake. But he, he did something when the Bay of Pigs happened that other politicians have tried to learn from, I don't know they've fully done it, uh, he said, I, I take responsibility, it was my mistake. His popularity went up. Since that time, politicians were very often saying, I take responsibility, then they often don't take responsibility. Um, but if you actually take responsibility as you did, your popularity might go up because people see you actually admit mistakes. Um, tragically, when he, he died after just a thousand years, he didn't have, a thousand days, he didn't really have the, the legacy that a two-term president would have, but I think he did inspire people, and many of the things that Lyndon Johnson pushed through, the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, and other things were, and the Immigration Reform Act, were things that Kennedy had proposed. So he, clearly we learned much more about him um, after his death than we knew before he was uh, um, uh, killed, but I, I do think he inspired many people in my generation to want to go into government and to do public service. One of the biggest questions among historians, as you and I have talked about, is, you know, do you rename schools that were named for people right. who do not look as admirable in 2021 as they may have looked to some people at an earlier mo moment? Do you take down statues? So my question is, is a society, is that something that we should always be evaluating, or what do you think? Well, I think we should always look at new facts. Um, you know, as uh, John Maynard Keynes famously was asked, uh, when he changed his mind on something, well, when I'm presented with new facts, I change my mind. Uh, what do you do? And so if you get new facts, you should look at things. But as a general rule of thumb, um, I think you should look at what the person has done with his or her life as, 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 as the most important part of his or her life. So Washington Monument, uh, should we take it down because George Washington was a slave owner? Well, he did some other good things besides being a slave owner, so I would argue you should not. Um, some people have proposed getting rid of the Jefferson Memorial because uh, he was a slave owner as well, and I would say he did some other good things, probably not to change that, but I've been involved in trying to, uh, at Jefferson Memorial, make sure we tell more about the story, and at, at Monticello, make sure we tell more about the slave owning parts of his life, but, and make sure people know the good and the bad. Now, if you erect a monument principally 
because you're trying to honor somebody for something like um, um, you know, slavery, then I think that is a different situation. Many of the Robert E. Lee memorials were erected um, in the early part of the 20th century. And they were erected to remind people of slavery and the so-called lost cause, and that's a different situation. I recently, for a PBS series that I'm filming, I went to, to, went to um, Stone Mountain in, uh, in Atlanta, and there, this is this gigantic piece of granite that comes out of the, uh, the ground, and it's the biggest piece of granite that's out of the ground in, in the world. And over many, many years, uh, the uh, images of Stonewall Jackson uh, Jefferson Davis and Robert E. Lee are, were carved into this as a symbol of the lost cause and a symbol of, um, of, of uh, the virtues of slavery, I suppose. And there's been a struggle in, in Georgia for many years, should we change it or not? It's the law of the land that you can't change it in Georgia. And uh, you know, so really, is it appropriate to kind of change that or not? And it goes back and, I go back and forth in my mind whether it's good to show it as a symbol of the bad things that the people have done or should you change it? That they're, they're still debating that um, in, in Georgia right now. But I think generally I would, I would think there should be some changes. For example, I put up the money, some of you may know, to, to uh, re um, rehabilitate uh, Arlington House. Arlington House is at the, at the top of Arlington Cemetery. And I thought when I went to see it a few years ago, it was really decrepit. And I, I told the Park Service uh, how much would it take to fix it. And I, I said, OK, fix it up and make it clear that we have slave quarters here because it was a slave house. It was actually built to honor George Washington, but Robert E. Lee married into the family. He, he used it as uh, his house. And um, I, I've written some things saying that I think they should change the name of it from the official monument of the U.S. government to Robert E. Lee to just Arlington House, but that still hasn't been changed in Congress uh, yet. So I think some things we probably should change some names, and if we're honoring people for the wrong reasons. But I, as a general rule, I think you have to look at each thing on its own merits. And, and maybe if it's a local monument, make the decisions as locally as possible. That would probably be the best thing, if, if possible. Um, in, in some cases, the federal government may be involved in things that are federal around the, around the country. But as a general rule of thumb, I don't want to completely destroy everything that was ever erected, uh, even though it was erected. In some cases, the people who have done things aren't perfect. I mean, there's nobody has a monument to himself or herself in this country who's perfect. At least I haven't met anybody yet. So you could argue, and many people do, if we shouldn't have monuments to FDR because he did some things that were anti-Semitic. Um, you can go through anybody's life, except your life and my life, and find things that are not perfect, right? I, I was about to say right, that, right, but right, thank right, you. Okay, okay. <laughs> uh, I'm going to ask David two more questions, and then uh, we've got, I think, a few minutes right, for questions right. from the audience, questions or correction. No corrections of anything David has said, but corrections of anything I have said or revisions. Well, who do you think is the best president we ever had? Uh, the best, uh, I would say, Lincoln with the same qualifications. And who was second best? Uh, probably George Washington with all the flaws that you mentioned. And third best, uh, Jimmy Carter? Uh, well, Jimmy Carter had one of the most brilliant domestic advisors right, that right. ever served in the White House. Right, right, uh, right. <laughs> right, OK. All right. Uh, all right, two, two more questions, and then if anyone else has questions, we, we'd love to have that before we adjourn. Uh, how important is it to your reading of American history, the, the founders hoped to have created a system that they hoped that there would be good leaders, they hoped that good people would become president and be members of Congress and serve on the Supreme Court and, serve as, and be citizens and vote, right. but they felt that they had created a system that would not depend on the accident of someone right. good happen, happening to get elected, just as we're talking about a Lincoln or a George Washington. Did they succeed, or by your reading of American history, have we at certain crucial moments been vulnerable to what kind of person, for instance, is president? Well, you think about it. When this country was started, we had three million people in 1776, three million people. Half a million people were slaves, and they weren't allowed to participate in government. Uh, one and a quarter million were white women who weren't given the right to vote or own property if they were married. So you had one and a quarter million white men, largely Christian, who were the people that were running the country. Out of that one and a quarter million white men, we got George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, uh, James Madison, um, Alexander Hamilton, Benjamin Franklin. Now we have 330 million Americans, 100 times as many people as we had at the beginning. And where are the 
George Washington's, right, and, and John Adams, and so forth. Well, my theory is they've all gone into private equity. And, <laughs> um, but to be very serious, um, I, I think clearly it's, there is a downside to public service today that is much greater than even it was in the earlier days. In the earlier days, uh, there was vilification. There's no doubt that politicians were vilified as much today as they, I mean, much then as they are today. Vilification of, uh, was, was really terrible of George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, an enormous amount of vilification. But it did attract people because they thought they were building something and, and, and they had, you know, some other ability to do some other things on the outside. Today, it's a very difficult environment to be in public service, in, in my view. For example, in the Congress of the United States, the salary is roughly $180,000, hasn't been changed in 20 plus years or so. 85 members of the House of Representatives live in their the House offices, which is maybe illegal, um, because they can't afford a second house here. And, 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 and the scrutiny is so great, and the inability to, to do so many things is so um, strict that I, I think it, it discourages a lot of very talented people from coming into government. And I often think, okay, let's suppose we're gonna have a constitutional convention today. Who would be the 55 Americans we'd want? And would we want people who are members of Congress to be the only people who are in that constitutional convention? And what kind of talented people could we get if we got university administrators, uh, university presidents, foundation presidents, um, other people that are doing things good for society, and we put them together, and not just all white men, uh, obviously, and so we'd have a diverse group of people. What kind of constitution will we get out of it? It may be a better constitution than the one we have. We're probably not gonna have that experiment, but when you think back on it, um, we, we really do discourage people from going into public service. Another good example we're seeing every day is, is the confirmation process. Now, as you, uh, I think, talked about before, George Washington had problems with the confirmation process, too. And one time, I think he wanted to get some people confirmed. He went up to the House or the Senate to talk to them, and members were so disrespectful for him, he said, I'm never coming back, <laughs> and he didn't. Um, Today, he, he got the idea early on. Right, and so today we have uh, and our ambassadors in our country, we have, um, you know, we should have like 130 or 40 ambassadors um, around the world, or maybe more than that. We, we've only confirmed, I think, less than a dozen so far. And so, you know, it's a sad situation that getting confirmed is so difficult today, and the process is one where one person could put a hold on you, and as a result, you can be held up for a long time. It's very difficult to really say, I want to serve my country and do it as easily as you would, as you think it should be. It's a sad situation, I think. It really is. One more from me. Uh, a lot of people these days saying that they think that democracy is in jeopardy today in a way that it has not been before or maybe has not been since the Civil War. Is that overdrawn or does your reading of history suggest there's something to that? Clearly, uh, Western democracy, um, which reached its peak post-World War II, in the sense that after World War II, we were 50% of the world's GDP in the United States, and with Europe, we were two-thirds of the world's GDP and Western democracy, democratic countries. Now, obviously, you know, China and other countries have come forward, and we are less significant economically than we have been since World War II. We are probably not gonna be as powerful in all kinds of geopolitical things the next 20 or 30 or 40 years as we've been the last 20 or 30 or 40 years. But democracy still has a uh, hold on people that I think as a general rule, when you ask people what they prefer, as a general rule, people prefer democracy. Now in some countries, they would make a very strong argument democracy doesn't work. And we've seen our experiment in democracy hasn't been so wonderful uh, in some times. And, when we saw the events of January 6, a lot of people questioned whether our democracy was really that viable or um, really working as well. So I would say democracy still has some great benefits, and I think very few people who live in a democratic system want to get out of a democratic system, but not everybody in a non-democratic system is rushing into a democratic system because they see our system hasn't worked perfectly. And I think if you had a survey in, in certain countries uh, where they don't have democratic systems, I don't think you would necessarily get people saying, yes, I want to go to a democratic government. You wouldn't necessarily get that. Fascinating. Uh, anyone have any questions or comments? Uh, yes, Mr. Ambassador. Let's see, should, uh, should the ambassador have a microphone? Ambassador or? from okay. Singapore, a great democratic country. Thank you, Let's, Indeed. Thank you David, for doing this. And, uh, Taking from the answer to your last question, can you situate this American experiment within an international context? There was a very different international context in 1776. That international context changed. 
the U.S. became the single power after World War II. Today, it's no longer that case. And is these pressures from outside, these changing pressures, how will that impact on the American experiment? You know, the emergence of China as a very significant competitor, other issues. Where, how do you see the American experiment dealing with this international context? Thank you. Well, when you've been at the top of the hill for a long time, it's very difficult to accept that somebody else is going to be at the top of the hill. Uh, we all probably know there's a book written by Graham Allison called The Thucydides Trap, in which he basically argues that in 20 cases throughout the last 2,000 years of history or so, when you have a rising economic power, kind of challenging a dominant economic power, the dominant economic power thrusts back and often goes into military conflict. I think out of the 20 cases he he's, he cites, 15 of them led to military conflict. So clearly when you're at the top of the hill, you know, all the power and people are beginning to take it away from you, you don't like it. And so you react uh, in ways that are not, uh, I'd say, you know, terrific. Uh, the Vietnam War was a mistake and I think that was a terrible mistake. I think the Iraq War was a terrible mistake. Um, I think in Afghanistan we could have done, I, I have a theory of how we could have done it better, but we, we, we made, a mis made many mistakes there as well. So I think the United States has, in many of the cases, we've been afraid of losing a war, afraid of, of not being seen as a dominant or the most important country in the world, and that has produced some, I think, terrible outcomes for our country. I think we have to get, we have, in my lifetime, it won't make that much difference, but the younger people will have to recognize it. We're, gonna go, we're going to a bipolar world. We're pretty much in it now where China and the United States are dominating the world, and you basically have to pick sides, more or less, if you're going to be on the Chinese side or American side. And it's, we, we, the Americans, America has dominated the world post-World War II, but that's basically more or less ending, in my view. And given China's population, its wealth, it's, it's a different rival than, than we had with the Soviet Union, which was mostly a military rival, not an economic or technological rival. So it's a different world, and I, I think the United States is going to adapt to it slowly, and and probably not as well as maybe we should, but I, I suspect it, it's hard to kind of be at the top and all of a sudden you recognize you're not quite as much at the top as you were before, in my view. Interesting. Uh, hi, David. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay, this is okay, Steve Saccone. So I, I'm, I'm gonna first make a, a comment and then a question. Sure. So the comment is that, that you clearly have a great uh, love of American history uh, but I think that this is a time where we should acknowledge that you've also used your intelligence and your wealth to preserve so much of uh, the history of this country and uh, for future generations. And, and, and frankly, I mean, I, you've called it patriotic giving. Uh, and I think, frankly, we should all take, take a moment to thank you for what you've done. Oh, thanks. Um, oh. Anybody that gets lucky in the business world has more money than they probably really need. And so um, when you're involved in philanthropy, you can do enormous amounts of things that are good and sometimes some things that are not so good. Uh, in my case, uh, to be honest, about 90% of my philanthropy is for education and um, medical research, which is not that atypical of people. But uh, the 10% or so that is what I've called patriotic philanthropy gets 100% of the attention, which is strange in many ways. So for example, the Washington Monument. Um, I've made you know, gifts 10 times larger than that other places, um, but for $10 million, um, I got an enormous amount of attention because people said, well, why is a private citizen fixing up the Washington Monument? Which, why shouldn't somebody else do that? It's just surprising to me that more people haven't done this, and I've encouraged people in the Giving Pledge and other kinds of gatherings to do more of this kind of thing, and it hasn't quite caught on as way as I would like. But the reason I do it is to try to remind people of the history and heritage of our country. But mostly, this is the reason. We all know what the Washington Monument looks like. We all know what the Magna Carta says, or the Declaration of Independence says. So why do we need to preserve the Magna Carta or have an original copy of the Declaration of Independence or, or make the Washington Monument stable? Because the human brain has not yet evolved to the point where seeing something on a computer slide is the same as seeing it in person. So if you are going to go see the Magna Carta at the National Archives, you're going to probably, when you get ready to go, you're going to prepare for it. You read something about it. When you get there, you're going to get a lecture. And afterwards, you're probably going to be able to talk about it more and read about it more. And therefore, you'll be more informed. If you just saw it on a computer slide, you can just push a button and it goes right past you. Or the same as visiting Monticello or the Washington uh, Monument of Mount Vernon. If you visit one of these things that are still preserved, you can learn more about history and you're more inclined to learn more about it. And that, that's the real reason. It's not that we, uh, we, we're, we're going to forget what the words are of the Declaration of Independence and we don't preserve these copies. So I, I enjoy doing these kind of things. I just want to encourage more people to do it because 
I'm getting older and I need more people to help me to kind of do some of these things. So um, that's why I'm trying to spend more time encouraging people to do some of these similar things. But thank you very much for your comment. And, and if I could pipe in, David is too modest to say it, so I'm going to say it. History philanthropy throughout American history has been one of the toughest things to raise money for. And one of the reasons to honor David is that he was one of the rare few who saw how important this was and who basically has led the way for a lot of others oh. to come into this as well. Thank you. Yeah, all true. Question. Yes. Patrick, uh, you both, is this working? Uh, you both have written extensively on American presidents and history, and I was wondering if you could comment on what you feel are the primary traits, leadership traits, that uh, for, great, for greatness in presidents. Highest leadership traits of? Of, uh, of what, high, uh, what? most important leadership traits of great presidents? Well, I think um, self-confidence is very important. If you're going to be a great leader, I think you have a certain self-confidence and a certain amount of security. Um, I think President Kennedy had a great deal of self-confidence and therefore could make fun of himself, and I think that was endearing. Um, if you're insecure, uh, and uh, I think it's more challenging, uh, I, I think uh, presidents have a reasonable knowledge of history would be very helpful, but I think um, arrogance is a quality that I don't really admire that much, and I think if you're an arrogant person, you, you know, and Napoleon was probably arrogant and probably a good leader, and I guess imagine Charlemagne was giving himself that name, probably was great, uh, was arrogant, and I assume Alexander the Great didn't attach the great to his name because he was modest, but, <laughs> but I think in arrogance doesn't work as well, in, in my view, as, as a, for a leader. Um, in my view, a, a, a leader, a great president has to be somebody that has certain self-confidence of himself, certain amount of humility, but also somebody who's willing to make, take challenges on and willing to share the credit with other people. As Ronald Reagan famously said, there's no limit to what humans can accomplish if they're willing to share the credit. And I also think that you need to know how to work with other people and communicate. To be a leader, you have to have followers. And the way you get followers is one of three ways. You, you speak eloquently like Martin Luther King, you write eloquently like Thomas Jefferson or Abraham Lincoln, or you lead by example as George Washington did during the Revolutionary War. And I think you know, if, if more and more of our great leaders were to lead by example but doing what they actually tell other people to do, I think that'd be great. But we, we've been fortunate in many ways to have some really good presence, some not so good. When you think back on it, um, People ask me all the time, who's going to be next president of the United States? Go back three and a half years before each of the last ten presidential elections. Three and a half years before, which is roughly where we are now, um, for the next election. You would never have predicted any of these people would have been president of the United States three and a half years in advance. You never would have predicted Richard Nixon, probably coming back another time. You never would have predicted Barack Obama, Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, after he had failed uh, two times before to run. Um, or who would have predicted Joe Biden coming back now, or who would have predicted, uh, what was Biden's predecessor? Um, um, <laughs> Donald Trump, yes. You would never have predicted all these people. And it's just amazing. So I don't know who's gonna be president next time, but I hope they have some of the qualities I, I think we should, uh, we, we would want in our leaders. But it, it's difficult. Democracy is an imperfect process, and you're not gonna get the kind of leaders that uh, you always would, would hope you would get when you're teaching about these things, or reading about them, or, or designing. Uh, what the plans should be for the future. It doesn't always work that way. No, for sure. Uh, Judy, do we have time for two more? Yeah. Two more? Okay. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Uh, good morning. Sam Feist. Nice to see you. Oh, Thanks hi, for Sam. doing this, David. Yeah. Oh. You were just talking about qualities of presidents who were successful. Talk a little bit about the president that you worked for. Jimmy Carter exhibited lots of the qualities you just described, yeah. and yet he's okay. not perceived as one of the most successful presidents, at least while he was president. Um, one of the greatest historians in our country, David McCullough, wrote a book on Harry Truman, and for which I think he won the Pulitzer Prize. And it was an incredible book because he restored the image. He kind of went back and said, here's what Harry Truman did. And actually, it kind of changed the image. Truman left the presidency with a 15% popularity rating, more or less. And he was really condemned as an ineffective leader. Now we regard him as one of our stronger presidents. Jimmy Carter is um, in the same category. He left because he was defeated. He was considered unsuccessful, among other things. When you, when you are not uh, reelected, you're considered defeated. George Herbert Walker Bush considered ineff ineffective in some respects because he was defeated for reelection. 
Well, we accomplished a lot of things in his presidency that were good. In Jimmy Carter's case, he was, um, you know, clobbered in the election by Ronald Reagan. Therefore, Carter went back and licked his wounds in planes in many ways and eliminated the post-presidency stuff, which he's done a wonderful job on. As president, he was passing legislation left and right, and obviously with the work of Congress. And, but today, the only legislation we kind of get out of Congress is more or less appropriation bills, keep the debt uh, from the defaulting, and you know, occasionally you'll get a, 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 an infrastructure bill, which is an, more or less an appropriations bill. But you, with Carter, we had so many things that were transformative, and he just worked tirelessly. I, I thought he wasn't as good as explaining himself. He wasn't a great uh, uh, political speaker, and he hated politics. If you said to him, uh, this is the politically right thing to do, he would do the opposite. Um, he had many uh, flaws, as we all do. But on, in hindsight, I, I suspect the two books that have come out to him, about him recently, Kai Bird's book and uh, Jonathan Alter's book, have begun the process of doing what uh, David McCullough's book did for Harry Truman, which is to make people look again at, uh, at their presidency. Now, you've often said, Michael, that you can't really write about somebody until about 40 years after they're kind of gone or so forth. And Carter's now out of the White House about 40 plus years. Now, people are now beginning to look at him better. Um, than, than they did then. But I, I think he did a lot of very good things, including, most importantly, perhaps, restoring a sense of decency to the White House and a sense of morality. Um, and uh, while he may have worn it on his sleeve some, from time to time, he did in, instill people in, in the sense in, in this country that human rights was very important, and that was a really big change in our foreign policy. And, and isn't it a nice thing that he's lived long enough to see his renaissance? Yes, I mean, it, it's nice. He's 97 now, I think, at 97 yeah. years old and uh, married 75 years, so I don't know which is the bigger accomplishment, living to 97 or being married 75 years, but pretty impressive. I I'm not getting into that at all. Uh, <laughs> one more question. Yes, hello, Mr. Rubenstein. Thank you so much for this interesting okay. presentation. Um, I have read that you own about almost 100 Greek um, uh, manuscripts, and I was wondering if you could tell us what they're about and why you bought them. Oh, manuscripts. Uh, she was mentioning that she has read that you own about 100 Greek oh. manuscripts, and could you oh, tell why? Rare documents? True? Yeah, I think okay. that's Yeah, um, yeah I, I, I didn't hire McKinsey and say, what can I do to give back to my country? I stumbled into buying the Magna Carta because it was available, and I thought that it would likely leave the country, and one of the 17 extant copies, the only one in private hands, should stay in the country because it was the inspiration for Declaration of Independence. And after I bought it, um, you know, people started calling me and said, well, if you cared so much about uh, the Magna Carta, I have one too. And it turns out a lot of people have <laughs> fake ones, so I, I said, I don't want to corner the market on Magna Cartas. Um, and w I said, were these all genuine, David? Or uh, none people? of them were. There's only 17 of them. And I actually, the night I bought it, I went to have dinner I said, to, at the CEO of uh, Citicorp's house, and I said, I'm sorry, I was late. I just was, bought the Magna Carta. I was tied up in an auction. And he said, sure. So the next day was the front page of the New York Times. He called me and said, David, I'm sorry, nobody actually had ever come to my house before and actually had bought the Magna Carta. So I, and he didn't take me seriously until he read it in the New York Times. I, I bought a lot of these documents. I own a, a large number of declarations of independence and emancipation proclamations, 13th Amendments, and other historic documents because I put them on display around the country. N none of them are in my houses or anywhere. They're all on display at the Smithsonian or the National Archives or other places where I, people ask me to, to lend them to them because I want people to see them and be inspired to learn more about American history. That, that's the point of it. And uh, so I bought a lot of them, and then I'm probably going to buy some more of them. And I, I have a large collection of American historic books, um, which is you know one of the larger ones, I suspect, in the country. And I, these are things that I put on display around the country as well to get people to see you know, uh, uh, firsthand what, what the Federalist Papers looks like or the Common Sense or, or the, the manuscripts of the Star Spangled Banner, things like that, just as a way of inspiring people. No one person can do all that much to change the course of history. But, you know, when you're a business person, you know, what can you do? You can buy some things and maybe have people um, take a look at them. So I'm trying to just inspire people to um, learn more about democracy, appreciate it more, uh, you know, appreciate more of the country's history and learn the good and the bad, and that, that's really my, my only goal. All true. Are you signing books today? Absolutely. I'm happy to sign for anybody that wants one, and anybody that doesn't want one, I won't be offended. I, I'm not taking <laughs> lists of people. So I wanted to say uh, thank you all for, for coming, and Michael, thank you for um, being willing to uh, uh, be the interlocutor and ask me, uh, I admit, easy questions. Um, <laughs> uh, 
But um, thank you all for, for coming today, and thank you for all you've done for the Economic Club of Washington. Uh, we've been able to grow the club a fair bit with the help of uh, many of you. And uh, with Mary Brady, where's Mary? David, thank you so Mary, much. Thank, uh, you sure. inspire all right. us all, okay. and I wanted to present on behalf right. of the board of directors and the members of the Economic oh, Club a leather-bound version of your book, The okay. American thank Experiment, you. to add to your collection. Well, so thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. And I hope you'll stand up, uh, uh, say a few and, minutes uh, to sign books. Yeah. Thank you all uh, for coming. And uh, we have a gift for Michael, and which is a our famous map of Washington, D.C. Wonderful. Thank you very so, much. Let me give you this. Wonderful. Thank Mary, you. come in. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay? 